So people, because I'm a ambassador for Outriders and I have access to the private Discord, not two days ago we had a Q&A where we could put forth questions to the developers of Outriders. Obviously people can fly and today we go through the entire Q&A. How's it going guys? My name is DPJ and if you enjoyed the video, leaving a like really helps out and if you like what you see and want to see more, be sure to subscribe. So let's just start from the top and go through it all. So questions about the future of the game and they state basically in regards to what the devs have told them. If people love the game, they will think about what comes next, but they're focused on release right now and the delivery of the most important fundamentals of Outriders. The system is prepared for adding new content in the future, so that's good to know. They are currently not considering PvP. That's a great thing to hear. They are aware of the importance of Twitch extensions and are working on something, but it may not be there at launch and they can't promise anything. Seasonal events are something they would like to do, but once again, they are awaiting launch reception. There's so much more they could add and there are so many untold stories. So basically what we have here people, depending on the launch of the game and how well it's received, all determines the future content for the game. But with 2 million downloads within a week of the demo, I'm pretty sure the launch will go real good. Now in regards to how long the campaign and game will last, they say it's hard to give one figure on how long the game is. Because if you're only doing the main campaign content and no side quests, it will take less time than if you're doing all the side quests. Difficulty level also impacts how quickly you move through the game. It can take a very different amount of time depending on the individual. However you choose to play, it is long. PCF firmly believes that everyone will be happy with the amount of content they're paying for, no matter how you're playing personally. If you ignore all side quests or miss one, you can go back and complete it at your current difficulty level. They won't become irrelevant, that's good to hear. There will be cross save also between platforms like PS4 and PS5 for instance. Cross save though across different platforms they state is technically challenging and they're still working on it. It may not happen. There will be 6 character slots so you can have 1 slot per each class and then the last 2 slots for extras. There also will be no loadout system at launch. They had planned for it to be part of the game but right now they're electing to just make switching between builds as easy as possible without using a loadout system. Inventory is limited by slots per equipment piece. If you're running out of inventory space, you need to scrap items. However, there's enough slots that you're not going to be doing loads of inventory management. They said they experimented with an unlimited pool, but people weren't scrapping things for resources. They were hoarding instead. There is a vault that's accessible in hubs. About loot in instances, they state everyone has their own instance loot. They did try out shareable loot, but after balancing they found that individual loot pool per player works the best. This method encourages players to create their own build. Indeed it does. You can also play the game solo, and your experience of the game will still be very good. The wheel tier systems allow for this and it's essentially the difficulty level. As a solo player, with good equipment and a good build, you will be able to finish the campaign. Post campaign content is so lowable, but it will be hard, especially reaching the last expedition. There are no hard limitations saying you must be in a team of three for any of the content. Right now, balancing and creating for a party of three is the goal, and there is nothing planned for more players at the moment. They are relying on platform solutions like Steam, Discord etc for in-game voice chat, there will be none built in. There will be borderless windowed mode on PC. Next gen console performance is currently secret information they state. Controllers are supported on PC. There will be aim assist for controller users, but not to an intrusive level. If you don't like aim assist, you can disable it too. The convoy truck is fully cosmetic. It cannot be driven. Character customization, they state, is subjective. Some say the Outriders character creator is good enough because they're able to make the character they want, whereas others say it's not enough. It's not hugely extensive with crazy sliders, but it's enough to make someone unique. 
on to expeditions. There will be matchmaking in expeditions people. The expeditions are 14 completely new maps. Some are similar regions of the world so there are story and lore connections but the maps themselves are completely different and for expeditions only. Wow! There is no concern that the time based rewards will limit the meta in expeditions. Creating builds and finding solutions is a really important pillar in the game and there's definitely space for your own builds and theory crafting. They don't want there to be a strict meta. The time based reward system in expeditions doesn't define everything. It isn't really strict. There's space for experimentation in creating builds and trialing them in post campaign content. In playtesting they found that there are many different ways to build characters that can combine. They do not intend for there to be one best build in the game and your personal best build will depend on your own playstyle and who you are playing with. There is no one proper way to play Outriders. There will be some elements and mechanics in the expeditions that are not in the main campaign but they are keeping that a surprise for now. At times you will need to think what is the best way to tackle this. The new mechanics are not completely different from the rest of the game. Balancing the game is really complex because there are so many different ways to build a character. They are able to balance on the fly and they state they will be observing the meta and buffing and nerfing if needs be. They fully intend to work with ambassadors and players to do this. They firmly believe this is a process they need to do with their players. Input Gun skills and gameplay Every gun has its own recoil pattern. There are guns with unique recoil patterns that depend on how you are firing the gun. All explosive guns and projectiles have splash damage. Mods can also add splash damage. You can build your character towards some specific classes using the character tree but it's entirely up to you if you choose to use these particular nodes. It's more about if one particular gun will work with your particular build or approach. These nodes change the way guns behave rather than just adding raw damage. You have access to 8 skills in total and you will choose those skills via UI. The skills on items are modifications and some of these modifications are connected to the skills in the skill tree. Other mods add additional effects or modify weapons. Some epic variants of guns have randomized modifications which can impact the appearance of the gun. The more unique the gun, the more art and gunplay are connected. Pretty cool. The importance of cover entirely depends on the character you're building. You can create a character that avoids cover entirely or create a character that's very reliant on cover. Playing aggressively will be really rewarding for some classes. For others with a different approach, it may be wiser to use cover more often. It's all down to personal playstyle and Outriders accommodates both. If you don't want a really hard challenge, it's a great game to play and drink with your mates. You can adjust that world tier or play a particular build or class depending on what you feel like on a particular day. Sometimes you want to really test yourself, other times you may not want to. Outriders accommodates both casual and hardcore players. On to the lore people. The fact that there is actually something on a supposedly empty planet is a key pillar of the story. So talking about it is something of a spoiler and it's better to explore it and think about it for yourself. The anomaly is causing the overlap between nature and technology. Lots of technology from earth is destroyed by the anomaly. People and items that bond with the anomaly can become something brand new and very special. Just like the player, character and other altered. But this happens to technology too. There are different factions who believe different things about what happened to earth. Some people believe it was experimentations but really no one quite knows. Why did the colony think something different would happen on Enoch from what happened on earth? There are characters in the prologue who even believe that Enoch will be the same situation as Earth and have little hope. No one's certain about the future of humankind. Most of the Enoch fauna and flora want to kill humans and there's only really hostile relations between humans and the planet, not between flora and fauna. Factions won't be fighting each other. The player is the main killer of bad stuff on the planet. There is more than one monster hunt quest in the game 
there are plenty of monsters pretty cool and their closing words making a game has been a lot of work stress and challenges they say they're proud of what they've made Bartek said that every aspect of the game's production has its own ups and downs and pros and cons. Pyotr's favourite part of working on the game was working on the skills and the class trees. He really enjoyed finding out how different skills would work together. But it doesn't end there guys, there's more details which I think are worth covering in terms of demo reception, cheating and hacking, inspirations for the game and a few other things. So let's check them out too. So a demo reception. It was surprising that more than 2 million played in one weekend and satisfying to see that it was received so well. They didn't have any expectations as to what would be amazing or what would be tragic. Although they weren't prepared server wise for the great response of course. They received loads of positive feedback which they state was incredibly rewarding and helps to balance the inevitable negative comments. All the negative comments they state are feedback that is being analysed. The demo is a great way to gather information so that they can get issues ironed out ahead of the full release. They are working daily on fixes, if not immediately for the demo, then for the launch of the game. They then go on to talk about cheating and hacking. Unfortunately, cheaters and hackers exist. They state they are working on fixing this as a priority. They have daily meetings to address how to tackle this and they want to make sure that they don't make any harsh decisions that impact non-cheaters. They don't want to punish cheaters who carry that attitude into multiplayer and make their lives as hard as possible when it comes to attempting to play the game in this way. The demo was instrumental to realise this problem exists and they are glad that they will be able to make a battle plan before launch to defeat it. People can Flutter's approach is that because the game is not fully on a server, cheaters will always be able to locally manipulate game files. However, the moment they connect to the server, People Can Fly can very clearly identify who is cheating. Additionally, in the demo, people can make multiple accounts or so take in actions to chase individuals down feels a bit pointless. There will be an action plan when launch comes around. Most importantly, they don't want to hurt those who are legitimately farming and they think they have a way of legitimately identifying this. One of the penalties they're considering is not allowing cheaters into multiplayer. If cheaters want to cheat in single player, then they can do that if they think it's fun. They just don't want those people to affect other players. The cheaters right now are giving them information about how they're cheating. So they're using the information to help them come up with the plan. Inspirations for the game we see they state Gears of War, which is quite clear people. If you want to read through this, you can pause the video and read through it. Same with the darkness and humour, but what we will get into is the healing mechanic. The healing mechanic wasn't there from day one. There weren't any classes in Outriders in early development. All skills were available to any player, and mechanically, this functioned fine. However, players began to feel lost with all the choices and found it difficult to find an identity for their outrider, as well as figure out how the game wanted to be played. They created classes to fix this, and the healing mechanic helped to differentiate between the classes. They're really glad they went with classes in the end. On to meta, they expected people to hit max tier in the demo easily, because it's a demo. They knew people would then begin farming the possible equipment at that level. In the full game, world tier will continue upwards and they would expect to see repeated speed run kills of NPCs like Gores reduce. They don't imagine that behaviour will stick in that way in the full game. They've been surprised that players have been patient enough to farm for hours in the demo and how popular it has been. They're glad to see this is because it means the mechanics are working as they should. In terms of meta, they're trying to collect all the data and not make any immediate assumptions based on the demo alone. They are taking notes of what might be broken and what seems to be working and what may be boosted or buffed. However, if there is a demo meta, they don't want to make any changes now as the computation will be a million times more in a full game. The demo doesn't even scratch the surface of crafting the mods. The real meta will come. They are tracking it all the same and watching loads of ambassador streams to do so. It's not the right moment to say what's broken or if there's a meta. They believe in players finding the solutions and working with the community to create the meta. They don't want everyone 
playing the same style, so we'll adjust the meta accordingly. Transparency They are not creating a game as a service which they feel moves against where the market seems to be heading at the moment. People expect transparency from a developer, so why should they not do that? It seems a natural way to be as a developer, so beyond launch. Theory crafting. There are lots of new things to experience in the full game, even beyond guns. Bartas is super excited about their theory crafting people will be able to do using bigger and better mods. They decided to only show some legendaries in the demo, congratulations to people who found them all. But there's loads more, as well as armor. They expect that when crafting becomes available, then a lot of new options will become legitimate. There are plenty of items that might not be perfect, but after crafting can become really powerful. Okay, so to talk about then, replayability, endgame and solo play. They want to give players places in the full game where they can find the best items, build the best builds, while experiencing a challenge and having fun. For people can fly, replayability is the core principle of the game. Players also have the possibility of repeating a campaign and expeditions. There aren't any plans for something like a horde mode at launch, but who knows what will come down the line. Stay tuned. Progress through the game is down to the personal player, how well you understand the game and the strength of your build. The very end of the game, the Eye of the Storm, will be really challenging if you're a solo player and your build will need to be perfect to do it by yourself. So a couple of quick fire questions they did answer, a blood and gore toggle, right now they aren't considering this. Auto skip cutscene toggle, they haven't yet thought about making this, they have taken note of the request but understandably it's a low priority, note there are some unskippable cutscenes as the game is loading streaming in the background. Visible throwing arc, you do get extra information about the throwing arc when you hold the skill button but it's not on every thrown skill. Right now, they haven't planned it for the skills that don't have it, but have taken the feedback on board. They've also noted that it's their bad, that the holding down the skill button mechanic isn't obvious. Inventory locking. They are trying to figure out how best to accomplish this. They want to find a balance of what's easy and accessible versus not making it too easy. Protection versus convenience. Cutscene frame rate issues. They have high hopes that the cutscene frame rate issues will be fixed for launch, but they can't make strong guarantees at the moment. They are trying their best to address this. The migraine issue. There are two mods that are fighting with each other, so yes the gun is currently not functioning as intended. The second mod makes the first mod not work all the time. They are going to rework their legendary, so the second mod will be changed to make the first one work all the time. People who have the migraine will have the updated version following launch. Grim Mara issue. They're going to check if the Grim Mara has the same issue, and if it does, then the same fix will be put in place. Limited stash slots. The stash is limited, and their experience with different numbers currently they're planning between 50 and 100 slots. Stash is shared between all characters. Auto scrap. Players should be deconstructing across their inventory and stash and they're not keen to automate too much of the process. So while there is a work in progress plan for auto scrap, they want to eventually decide with the community what the best decision is. Epic Rarity Time Manipulation Bug The epic time manipulation wasn't expected at all and not to that extent. Transmog No transmog at initial release, but they will look into this in the future. Lost items, and I've experienced this myself people, I had two migraines disappear, unfortunately. They're looking into what to do about people who have lost their items. They do have a fix for the latest bug, but they will be tracking other issues as they arise. April 1st release date. April 1st feels solid. From their point of view, there's no risk that it will not release in 3 weeks. They're counting the days. Unlockable cosmetics. There are no other cosmetics you can unlock during the game, but you can unlock cosmetics for your truck. There are no plans at release to add more character customization options. In-game chat and leaderboards. There are discussions at the moment about in-game chat and in-game leaderboards. There are no immediate plans. They want to tackle the most outstanding issues and request first, then see what they could potentially do in the future. 
And there we have it guys, and wow this video went on a lot longer than I thought it would do. And I hope I covered a issue or question you may have had. And if any more of these dev Q&As pop up people, I'll be sure to let you guys know about them. But yes, on that note we have come to the end of the video. Some interesting things to talk about, so if you want to chat with me, jump in my stream later today. But yes guys, if you enjoyed the video, leaving a like really helps me out. If you're new around here and want to see more Outriders, be sure to subscribe. And hopefully people, I will see you on that next one.